Hello, 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 everybody. I am so excited about tonight's conversation. You have no idea. But first, a little bit about me and our organization, our bookstore. My name is Ramonda Young, and I am owner of Mahogany Books, along with my amazing husband, Derek, and our daughter, Mahogany. We've actually been in business, believe it or not, 14 years. And about three and a half years ago, we opened up our first physical location in the historic community of Anacostia in Washington, DC. Uh, before that, we were online. So 10 years online and about three and a half years um, in our first physical location. I'm excited because we're opening up our second physical location this summer at National Harbor. Um, so if you're ever in the Washington, DC area, please come out and see us. We would love to hug your necks, kind of socially distance hugs, I guess. L would love to see you um, in our store, but of course you can always visit us online at mahoganybooks.com. Uh, we actually created the hashtag Black Books Matter um, where a little bit over 50,000 people are using that hashtag, which we're so honored and excited about. Um, just, just excited to be uh, um, selling books that are focused on um, people of the African diaspora. So we sell books that are for, by, and about people of the African diaspora. So this conversation tonight is right in the pocket of who we are as booksellers and community leaders here in Washington, D.C. So enough about me. Let's get to the main event. We are here to talk about a black women's history of the United States. And if you all know of, of the book industry last year, this book went crazy for us. It was one that always kept flying off our shelves, one that customers always kept asking about. And so it's an honor for us tonight to be able to have this conversation. It is now released in paperback. So if you don't have the hard copy, that's all right. You can get the new paperback release that just came out last month. So on to our two doctors. You talk about extra black girl magic. I am thrilled to have two women who are really about their business and are experts when it comes to history and women. So first up, we have Dr. Callie Nicole Gross, who is a professor of African-American studies at Emory University and creative productions director for the Association of Black Women Historians. Her latest book that we're here to talk about tonight, co-authored with Diana, Diana Ramey, Barry is a Black Women's History of the United States. Um, her previous award-winning books include Colored Amazons, Crime, Violence, and Black Women in the City of Brotherly Love, and Hannah Mara Tabs and the Disembodied Torso, a tale of race, sex, and violence in America. You all need to get your hands on all of those powerful, powerful publications. And then we have Dr. Dinah Ramey Barry. She's also an author and historian. Dr. Barry is the Oliver H. Radke Regents Professor of History at the University of Texas at Austin and the History Department Chair. She's actually the first person of color to take this role. Uh, Dr. Barry is a scholar of the enslaved and specialist on gender and slavery, as well as Black women's history in the United States. She is the award-winning author and editor of six books, not two, not three, but six books. Her most recent publication, as we mentioned earlier, is A Black Woman's History of the United States, who she co-authored with the amazing Callie Nicole Gross of Rutgers University. Um, the um, Empowering Testament, the book is an empowering testament of Black women's ability to build communities in the face of oppression and their continued resistance to systemic racism and sexism. Professor Barry completed her BA, MA, and PhD in African American Studies and U.S. History at the United uh, University of California. Please help me welcome to the stage these amazing doctors, these amazing ladies um, to the stage for this powerful discussion tonight. Thank you, thank you both for being here. I had to read the bios because I wanted to make sure I get all those accolades included because you all worked so hard for that. Thank you so much thank for having you. us. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely, my pleasure. And we're excited to, to be part of this conversation. I'm going to minimize my view so I can be <laughs> full on um, with this conversation. So again, thank you. Thank you. So Callie, this is one of the first times that we get to just talk to each other. Um, I think since the book came out, I, we've talked at people, but we haven't really talked to one another that much. It's true. I was thinking the same thing. Um, I, do I sound echoing you? No, you okay. sound good. Yeah. As long as it's clear. No, it's true. I'm, I'm excited about this. I was thinking, where where do you want to start? I think we should start with um, like the background, like about how the book came about 
And I think we should also talk a little bit about how it's been received and like a little bit of our experience over the last year. You know, maybe okay, that's, what, sure. I mean, and we can see what we go from there, see what, see where we go from there. Okay. So I'll, let me interview you. So how did you come up with this book? <laughs> okay. So actually the origin to this book, um, there are many origins. Ina and I worked together at UT Austin and we have actually been sort of talking off and on about the need for a newer kind of historical survey of Black women's history. At the same time, we were contacted by an editor from Beacon Press, mm -hmm. um, Gayatri Pedayek, about the possibility of doing such a survey. Mm -hmm. So it seemed like everything just sort of aligned and it came together. So that's like the simple origin. Yes. But I really feel like the project got legs when we were like struggling with our outlines and our drafts and we, you know, threw ourselves on the mercy of our our sister scholars who we convened for this workshop. And we just basically spent a day with these brilliant, generous scholars mm -hmm. hashing it out, right? What, Absolutely. What would this thing really look like? That was a great day. Way in now. Yeah, no, that was a great day because you know, we were at, uh, when you were at Rutgers, you're now at Emory, but we were at Rutgers and there was a snowstorm. We, we, people's flights were getting canceled. So one of our colleagues, Dr. Rhonda Williams, um, who's at Vanderbilt was not able to come. Um, I was traveling with my mother um, and we were, you know, wasn't sure if we were all gonna make it, um, but we got there and I think it was like almost 12, a 12 hour day where we just sat around a table um, in this beautiful space and to have 10 other, you know, sister scholars there um, looking at what, you know, we really put ourselves out there because some of the versions of what we shared, um, I, I can say were pretty rough. Like some parts were like rough cut, like that should say, should have stayed on the edited, edited floor, editing room floor. Um, but we had some chapters were outlines. Some of them were actually fully drafted chapters. Some of them had like sections that were there and then others, what we lost Callie for a minute, but I'm gonna keep talking. Um, we had some uh, connections that were there um, and the chapters were doing fine. Um, and then we had others that we just kind of weren't sure where we were going. So we'd have part of a chapter and then part of an outline. Um, and so it was a great conversation because we sat around with all of these other scholars and they gave us ideas. Um, they talked about things that we had missed or, you know, you made assumptions about the, the, the audience in this way. Um, you, you know, what, one of the things that we were really proud about to bring this, this really, really rough draft to these sister scholars, right? Remember, was that we had all these women that nobody would have heard of. We were trying to find like all the gems of black women's history, names that people would have never known that hopefully would then become famous, right? Like, and the first thing that they said to us was, uh, you need to put in Harriet Tubman, you need to put in I Ida B. Wells, you need to put in, you know, Shirley Chisholm, all these names of women that anchor folks so that they know who their contemporaries were. So we had all the women that worked in their same communities with them, but not the actual anchors. So it's really, really interesting. Um, that was not a, criticism that we were expecting, um, but it was really, really valid, valid advice. Um, and I think also we spent some time talking about um, the timeline of the book, right? Didn't we talk about, yes. you know, the, we, the, the periodization, right? We did. I mean, that was the other piece. One of the things that was, was this challenge was we wanted to do a really good job and we wanted to on one hand, it was not meant to be like the end all be all history about black women. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to sort of pique people's interest mm -hmm. and be kind of a broad, broad strokes. But we still wanted to represent all kinds of black women's experiences mm -hmm. and we wanted to incorporate um, themes that we don't normally discuss. And we wanted to center black women's experiences and so that is how we got onto this whole periodization discussion <laughs> yeah right? how are we framing these chapters on one hand we wanted them to be legible in case people wanted to use them in courses but on the other hand we also wanted to um to have black women's history drive mm -hmm. the the narrative from start to finish and absolutely so that meant how we structure these chapters, what this periodization was going to look like. It was just, it was a really intense, generative day. It was. But it, it, was. it completely transformed the, the manuscript. And I think from that is when we really started to have 
black women at the forefront. Like yes. opening with the vignettes yes. of black women who represented these periods, naming the chapters after the women themselves. Yeah. 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 Like really just going taking every possible step to have black women's experiences really kind of drive and shape the whole book. And think, also it was yeah. important to include you know, the experiences of black queer women and mm -hmm. women who have been incarcerated, but also you know, every time we try to have a, a book where folks could pick it up and recognize themselves or folks yes. in their family or people mm -hmm. they're allied with. Yep, absolutely. I think I remember that one of the, my favorite parts of that was like figuring out and remember going back and forth with you so much, like we would over email, over phone about, um, deciding like who to start the chapters with, like who represents this chapter? What's the best opening? How can we bring the reader into this time period in American history? Um, does this woman or girl or young lady tell the story that we want to tell in this chapter? And that was fun because we had like, you know, lists of people we were going back and forth and talking about why different people would work. And I remember just enjoying that part of it. And then just the discovery of so many remarkable young black women, girls and mothers and, and um, just um, remarkable women that 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 sprinkle our history books, uh, or that haven't sprinkled our history books, that we hope that this book would actually add to that conversation. I think one other thing I think we should say too is that um, we not only stand on the shoulders of the ten women that were in that room, but we stand on the shoulders of a, a of a, a team of scholars, a, a ge generations of scholars that have been doing <laughs> Black women's history. Yes. Um, you know, from that starting in the 1970s with Angela Davis publishing an article. Um, yes. on black women in slavery, and then moving forward to, you know, other scholars like uh, Gerda Lerner, uh, Darlene Clark Hine, um, uh, Paula Giddings, Paula you know, Giddings, we could go on and on. Yes. Th there was always, you know, these generational sort of studies right. um, that were sort of foundation, White. Deborah Gray White. Um, I mean, we had the Jeremy. benefit of them in the workshop. We but did, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And Ro Rosalind, the late Rosalind Turberg Penn, who was at Morgan yes. State for a number of years. So there was all these, and we both were trained by black women scholars. So we right. had, um, we had like a, a legacy of women to lean on and their scholarship to lean on. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of felt like it had been about what, 20 years since the last sort of general study, Kathleen Thompson and Darlene Clark Hines' mm -hmm. book, A Shining mm -hmm. Thread of Hope was published. And so right. then we thought, okay, it's time for us to come up with one right now. And let's let's see if we could do it for, for this generation, right? For sure. So. The other thing that I really like about about the book, and this is your genius idea, Dinah. I really like that we started with Isabel de Oliveira. Yeah. Talk a, talk a little bit about Isabel. Oh my gosh! So Isabel is someone that like um, historians of the American West probably have heard about. So we're not the first people to unearth her story by any means. Um, DJ McDonald and uh, Quintard Taylor have both written about her, um, but we we felt like we wanted to start the story of black women that were free because so much about what we learn about American history has African-American people or people of African descent as enslaved. And that's how we've come to this country. That's how people have marked our space for the first 245 years. And that's not how we came into the world, right? Um, and for the most part. And so we wanted to start off with people that were free first before they were enslaved. And when we found Isabel, we thought that she was great, Isabel de Overa. Um, we open up with her in chapter one. Um, this is a woman of African and Indian descent. Um, she goes to her local, um, I think it was her mayor of her city um, in Mexico, and she files a petition to go on an expedition. I mean, this is amazing. So you have a black woman explorer. I mean, you know, that's I would that's how we would characterize her. It might be an exaggeration, but you know, this is someone who on her own. Um, she says she's not bound by marriage or slavery, which we think is hilarious, and um, that she wants to go on this expedition uh, to which is later becomes New Mexico. Um, and she wants to make, she knows that she's going to annoy people because she's a mulatta and she wants a piece of paper. And she ends her testimony by saying, I demand justice. So for us, here is a woman of African descent who's free, who's advocating for herself, who asked for a petition and is demanding justice. And we believe that black women started off in this country demanding justice. And I would argue, and we both would argue that they're, we are still demanding justice to this very day. Absolutely. That was one of the, the through lines really throughout that history, thinking yeah. about it, 
you know, we have these themes that we organize the book around, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, sexuality, violence, yeah. art, resistance, labor, um, experiencing mm -hmm. a criminal justice system, um, migration, movement, right? All these themes, but that, that drive, that passion, that demand for justice mm -hmm. is also this sort of consistent theme, I think, in Black women's history and in the book. And we encountered it in ways great and small. Like, yeah. were, you know, just blown away by that. You know, we're, we're both historians, we do Black women's history, but in writing this book, I mean, I still was blown away by some of the histories that we, you know, we learned about it. I learned a lot in the process. At points, I was like devastated. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it was, it was yeah. an intense process, but that spirit, that passion, that demand, the drive for justice, yes, and the ability of Black women to collectively organize, yes, um, seem like this just sort of overarching kind of um, characteristics that have sort of made me think a lot about how, how I reckon Black womanhood. You know. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing. Um, so let me ask you this. We get this question a lot, like two questions for you. One is who is your favorite person in the book? And the second is who do we not include that if we were to write another edition, which, you know, who would we include? Oh gosh, that, that, that second question hurts. You know, it's like, oh, it we have does, a story about that too. It's, it does <laughs> But you know, I'm gonna start with a painful question first. Okay. So, if so, as I said in the beginning, right? We this was not meant to be like the exhaustive end yes. all be all book on Black women's history. Right. So we knew we couldn't get everybody in. We try really hard, but I do wish, in retrospect, that we had a little bit more about like Black women who work in like STEM. Yes. So yes, that yes. We do, you know, I think it's like one or two examples. But it's like short, it's in passing too. It's not even it is. We could have done is. a whole chapter on that, right? Really. So that's that's one piece that I definitely think I, I wish we could have gotten some more in. Yeah. Um and in terms of the, the favorite people, I mean there are so so many. Um, I usually talk about Frances Thompson just because I'm blown away by her. Yeah. Um, that also really like, you know, Mrs. Kelly Hamilton too. You I know, the that. woman who went to jail because she she demanded that this white Southern judge refer to her as like Miss Hamilton, not by her first name, like in yeah. the fifties. That's hilarious. <laughs> but, like I love her, right? Like yeah. just that demand. You know? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Those are some of my my favorites for sure. So I'll, now now turn that question over to you, Doctor Barry. Who are your favorites? Well, I already talked about my favorite, which was Isabel, but Isabel I think De yeah, Isabel de Vera. Who would you um, have added there? Oh boy, I mean, I think one of the things we did with the paperback, we did add a very sort of another thousand words, not a whole lot, but we did add some to the epilogue. Um, I think right now, given everything that's happened since the book has come out. Um, the role of black women in politics. I mean, we do talk about it with women that are running for office. We talk about, you know, Carletta Bass, and we talk about other, you know, other black women in there, Shirley Chisholm. Um, but I think like to bring it forward, you know, there's like something like eight, don't quote me, I think there's eight black women mayors right now. I mean, that's huge. That has happened since we began, I mean, of major cities. Um, and so I think that's worth noting. Um, black women have really moved into the political arena to me in similar ways that we saw black men during reconstruction have that okay. moment where they were in the political arena and had uh, legislative roles in office and stuff. So I feel like we're kind of in a watershed moment right now. And I think if we could work that in towards the end of the book, um, if we went past, you know, the Obama election, I think we could have, we could have done that. Um, that's the one thing, but, and then I think I'll just say this, and this is I probably, I don't know if I should say this, but I remember when I was getting on an airplane once, should I tell the story? You know, or no? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I don't want to get in no. trouble. Yeah. Well, but no. let's say I saw a famous person that we had forgotten, and not that person will remain shall remain nameless. And I called uh, Dr. Gross on the cell phone on the plane. I was like, before we took off, I said, "Okay, do we have her in the book?" She was like, "No." And I was like, "Ah!" Because I was I had copies of the book, and I was going to bring it to her and say, "Oh, thank you for your work." And I was like, "Okay, I can't even say anything. I can't. That's so embarrassing. I can't." Here we do a Black woman's history. We see this person. I can't say anything. So she's in there now. 
<laughs> See, that, 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 but I mean, that was also a part of our struggle when we were trying to elevate voices of, of women yes. who people hadn't heard of before. Yeah, so they're asking us to tell them. I, I don't know, because I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to ever. No, you know, no, 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 no. <laughs> Another time, another time. For yeah, us. we will, but, we will. <laughs> it was um, an illuminating moment. So yeah. I do have a question for you, though. Mm -hmm. what, was, what was the hardest part about doing uh. this book? You know, I always go to the dark part. Yeah, I know. Well, I got, well, you know, I can sit in this, the hole of the slave ship. So, you know, that's where I live part time when I'm not working, functioning in the 21st century. So I think the hardest part was trying to find, and we talked about this a lot, like ways to really bring the, the experience of the Middle Passage forward into the book so that the reader doesn't, I mean, we, were, we struggled because we were kind of going chronologically. And I didn't I remember talking to you about, we were like, well, how far do we go into this space and this experience? We don't want to lose the reader, but also we don't want to, we want to be true to the history. And so um, going into that was really hard. Um, but I remember trying to find ways to let the reader experience the Middle Passage in a way that um, would be important to understand how that first ship, um, you know, where Angela was on, um, you know, the, the 1619 voyage that so many of us have been talking about for the last uh, you know, year, year and a half or so, um, really that, that was a much longer journey. And to try to go back, remember when we were looking at the research side to try to understand where they may have come from. And there's other scholars that are doing that work, but just trying to, to bring that um, 20 odd Negroes that were disembarked in, at Jamestown, Virginia or Point Comfort, Virginia, you know, bringing that uh, piece forward, I think that was challenging. And then also all the, all the black women in wars that we were trying to uncover um, it was it was easier as we got later in, like we got the Civil War, but when we were looking at American Revolution, the War of 1812, and trying to find ways to to, to show Black women's presence right. when we didn't have their names, we didn't have all details of their stories. I think those were the hardest parts um, for me. And then just not wanting to lose a reader, because I I can handle and talk about slavery all day, but not all readers can, and I didn't want to lose anybody in that in that space. What about you? You know. <clears throat> So the, I think the hardest part, I mean, I agree with everything that you said, definitely all of that, I would echo all of that, and certainly keeping the narrative accessible and, mm -hmm. and engaging enough so that people want to push through all the way. Yeah. But I still think the hardest part for me is, is transcribing Emmett Till's mother's oh, yes, yes. description where she recounts what she saw the first time she viewed his body mm -hmm. um, after she got it back um, mm -hmm. yeah. from the, the, the folk yeah. after they heard of him. And just like the, the detail in it, listening mm -hmm. to her kind of describe what she yeah. saw and like acknowledge it and just the, the, the level of carnage that had been done to his body. Yeah. Um, I was I had to listen to it over over because I wanted to make sure I got it right, like mm -hmm. you know, the pause and you know, mm -hmm. and so it was like super intense. Like I was crying, mm -hmm. like stop, then come back, <laughs> you know, because yeah, because I wanted to make sure that I got it. And it, was, it felt like this duty, like you know, yeah. this mother can sit here and yeah. describe these injuries in detail mm -hmm. because she wanted to make us know, mm -hmm. right, this history. That I felt like I had to honor her and get it right, but it was it was intense. Like I definitely felt the effects of that. Yeah, and I think the other thing is that we've said before is that we both were writing this book um, and we were mourning the loss of parents. So I had lost my father, um, Callie had lost her mother, and then right not too long after that, her cousin, her first cousin. And so we were writing through um, a state of mourning and some and the book should have come out a lot earlier, but it came out when it was supposed to. Right. Um, but we were really going through that and trying to figure out, like, when we were going through the painful periods, not only of our own pain and our own grief, but also reading about the grief of, of mothers like Mamie Till Mobley and others that we were we were like, OK, if they could muscle through and be in front of like an audience of, you know, I don't know how many people at a funeral and and to do that in the midst of their grief. And then we were also at the same time writing when there are other contemporary black women mourning the loss of their children, their daughters, their sons that are being you know, murdered and 
and abused by the by law enforcement and citizens. You know, that's like all of that violence and writing at this time was sometimes hard to swallow. Um, and just also, it just puts you in, as a writer, it puts you in a different state of mind. Like I had trouble and I've, I've, I've had this before with writing and we've talked about this. I had trouble interacting with some people I was around, like it, just in general, some days I just was not wanting to be social. <laughs> you know how that is. Definitely. Oh, yeah. So. Definitely, definitely. All right. What was the triumph for you in the in writing? Oh, I know the triumph. This is going to be sound. This is this is the nerd. This is the archive rat. But this is when remember there was we were trying to find women in the American Revolution, and I was working with the student researcher, and I found a document that the, on the website it said that there was uh, an enslaver who went back to bring to bring back people from the, the American Revolution that they had, he had allowed them to go in the war and that there were seven men and one woman. And so we called, my student called the archive and we went back and forth and they're like, oh, there was no woman. There was no woman in this group. This enslaver didn't own any women. I was like, well, your de descriptive inventory on the website says, long story short, they're like, well, no, that's wrong. I said, okay, well, I'd like to have a copy of the document. So I bought it, remember this, we bought it and then they sent it and literally as big as day, and I have to, I have to find it, it was huge. It said uh, seven men and one woman. And so just like the level of erasure <laughs> that happens to black women historically also happened while we were writing this book. Um, there were black women that were in archival spaces that people were trying to not allow us to see. Um, but we felt like even though we don't know her name, it was important for us to, to have, to tell her story and to say that she was there. And this is a black woman that we know her and slaver sent them to, to be a part of the American revolution. And we wanted her story to be told. So that was, that was the triumph because I was like, I felt like we would claim somebody, even though we don't know her life, who she is. I feel like we were able to tell her story. She's a part of American history. What about you? I think uh, I know yours. Hands down, finding the engraving of Frances Thompson. Yes, that was huge. So for folks who don't know, Frances Thompson was this woman who had testified about mm -hmm. being attacked during the Memphis riots in 1866, just after, you know, folks were newly freed they were trying to access the right to citizenship mm -hmm. and you know just like racist white mobs intent on mm -hmm. inscribing the racial hierarchy of old so she testifies about being brutalized and sexually assaulted mm -hmm. before a senate committee it's one of these pivotal moments because it's sort of a, it marks this powerful moment where black women are again going on record to officially say that they did not consent right like reclaiming their bodies in this different way but then after that, she kind of just became like persona non grata. She was harassed by the police a lot. Um, there were all these accusations against her for running like a house of disrepute. They also accused her of being a, a man in women's clothing. And so they finally like arrest her and subject her to these medical um, examinations. And they say that she is that, even though she says that she was of double sex and chose to live in the woman, they said that she was the man and put her in prison. Mm -hmm. um, and so she still, you know, maintained her fight. People asked rude mm -hmm. questions to her. She would tell her none of their damn business. <laughs> I love that. None um, of your damn know, business. She survived her term, but she died shortly after. And I was, you know, looking around, trying to find her. And I tell this story all the time. Like, I never, a lot of people who use, like, eBay archives, for documents, rare mm -hmm. documents that people have that they sometimes auction off. Like, I never looked at it before or since. And I somehow randomly, like, found myself on the site and typed her name. And lo and behold, yes, she here's was. somebody with a copy of the Dean's doings from That's 1876 crazy. with the etchings of Frances Thompson in there. That's crazy. I know. <laughs> but you know what? That's like, isn't that weird how black women or black history in general is like in thrift shops at auctions like you know literally i mean like again right uh in, right. Just, in, in your everywhere. auntie's basement yes, in yes. your family bible yes, all yes. these things right people have these documents so it was super that was one of the big moments for me like yes i like, know I, Okay. And to have the so, two images was really important too. Yes, right? that, was, yeah. that was huge. So I know that now we're supposed to zip it and engage okay. questions. So friends, over to you. We will look in the chat 
for giving us your question and we're supposed to entertain. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. I actually love this format. There's no one in the world who has the type of insight back behind the scenes stories that the two authors have. So <laughs> we haven't you. done this. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We try to shake it up a little bit here at Mahogany Books. <laughs> For sure. So Love that it. was just, that was awesome to really hear what you were thinking and feeling as you were writing mm -hmm. um, different parts of the books. Um, so one of the questions I have here is from, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Vidya or Vidya Barnett. Mm -hmm. Her question is, is there any one particular um, story or woman that you were able to draw strength from as you were researching their story? Do you, do you want to go first? No, I want you to go. I got to think about it. Wow. Well, okay, so I'm always going to go to slavery because that's I'm a scholar of the enslaved. Um, there are a number of women that I would say, one I would probably go with is Mamima. I might be saying it wrong. I always get, I always get tongue tied on her name. This is the uh, McCoy twins mother um, who fought to have her daughters back uh, when they were taken at, you know, around two years old. They, th these are the two conjoined twins that were put on circus and stage and all people made money off of their bodies and freak shows and all kind of stuff. Um, but their mother, never stopped trying to get them back into their possession, into their family. They had, you know, several siblings. She even went to Europe and went to court. So here's a black woman in the 1830s, 1840s, I think it was, I don't remember the date right now, um, who went overseas and went to court to reclaim her children. Um, and I think that was pretty powerful. Um, and it wasn't something that was at all easy to do. So I gained strength from that, like the, the, how to continue to fight. Um, we didn't tell her story too much in here, but Sojourner Truth is another black woman who went and fought in the court system to, to get her child back, you know? So there's just those kinds of, like the, the ride or die kind of attitudes of black women who are not gonna stop um, and not, and, and also use the law and use the court system and, and try to operate within that system to gain their rights. So I think that's really motivating. Not that I necessarily have a lot of faith in our injustice system, but I'm just saying. Okay, those are, Whoa, that was a deep word right there. This Sorry. is a great question. <laughs> so, I mean, I definitely am, I'm in awe of, of Mamie Till. Um, just, you know, we'll always be in awe of her having sort of the presence of mind to make this heroic decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and then just learn sort of the backstory. Like, we all know what happened to Emmett Till and that his photo like help sort of like jolt kind yeah. of this movement. Mm -hmm. But you know, she had to like deal with the loss of her son. She had to mobilize local politicians to fight just to get his mm -hmm. body back. Mm -hmm. She had to go down there, we, you know, they had the casket nailed shut. She was getting ready to get a hammer and open up herself. Like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. she had to do all this fighting even before just even laying him to rest yeah. and then going to the trial every day you know with the harassment death threats um just you know an incredible incredible human being and um i teach they use the documentary the untold story of mm -hmm. Emma lewis till because she's in the documentary talking right you know this thing came out in 2005 and she passed a couple of years earlier but it mm -hmm. still gives you a sense of the proximity mm -hmm. when you talk to students about like Emmett Till I think it was like 150 years ago right you know, no <laughs> that's because they're young see his mom talking mm -hmm. about this in this documentary and so <laughs> so that so th that is really empowering for me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and then also it's another mother actually it is um, Nanny Helen Burroughs's mother, right, who actually was formerly enslaved and basically was largely a single mom. She sc scraped and scuffled and moved her family from Virginia hmm. up into the D.C. area to try to get like a better sort of education and access for her, you know, her, her children, one of them to life. And you know, because her father was an itinerant preacher to move mm -hmm. away for a long periods of time. You know, Nanny Helen Burroughs goes on to get her education, to found mm -hmm. a school to help educate other generations of folks. She organizes the National Association of Colored Women. So I'm just, those two women, I think are like these anchors for me about mm -hmm. what is possible. Mm -hmm. um, just incredible. 
Mm -hmm. uh, good, good. That's powerful <laughs> to hear, you know, their story, especially the one about Mamie. Um, mm -hmm. We just see this very veneered type story yeah. about mm -hmm. her. And so to be able to go deeper and kind of get that behind the scenes aspect of who she was as a woman, we don't, we just hear mm -hmm. about Emmy, but to hear about her mm -hmm. um, is, is huge. Um, one of the other questions I have here, it says, what do we need to do to make the study of black history and in particular black women in history across the diaspora, a more persistent part of high school mm. curriculum and not just an elective or during black history month. What do we need to do to do to make a change there? Like it's, it's all on y'all, it's all on y'all. <laughs> well, we try and we're trying and in, uh, in our own ways. Um, mm -hmm. By one, we're making this book into a young adult version. Yes. Is that the news? That's one of the newses. Oh, that's, that's one of the new is news is a word. I don't know if it is. It is anyway. tonight. <laughs> okay. It is. It is for me right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we're, we are, um, that's going to come out probably in the fall of 2022. Um, Tanya Bolden is the adapter and some of you may be familiar with her work. Um, so that's one way, but I would say that that's a loaded question. That's going to take a, uh, the kind of organizing that we saw um, in the civil rights movement that we're seeing now with Black Lives Matter, um, with the anti, you know, looking at uh, issues of, of police reform and all of that. Um, looking at, so how do we get the, the stories and the history of Black folks in school? One, we are slowly becoming electives. So at the K through 12 level, um, there are states that are allowing the ethnic studies requirement that's a one credit course that's now an elective. You can do Mexican American and African American in Texas, where I am. Other states are allowing that, and some of them are three credit courses. So that's good. That's the, that's a starting point. But really, where we need to go, there's a couple of things. One, we need to get with our state boards of education. We need to get with the the standards, the teaching standards, and make sure that Black women and Black people as a whole are included in those in the in the standards of what students need to learn about American history. Um, and that, you know, you know, black black people have been a part of American history in, in almost every time period that we have documentation for um, outside of when indigenous people populated before Europeans arrived. OK, um, that's right. so I, we yeah. need the pilgrims. That's there you, right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So so I think that there's 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 that. So dealing with the school board, getting uh, people to recognize it. And right now, you know, you can take an, a U.S. history and some professors and some teachers incorporate the African-American experience in that and give all credit to those that do. And mm -hmm. um, there's others that, that they consider that that should be a black history course and not a U.S. history course. So there's a way where we have to look at telling American history from multiple perspectives that include black people, that include black women. That's what I would say for that. Mm -hmm. The only thing I would add is, is that we've also been doing more and more work with um, teachers themselves, like mm -hmm. workshops with teacher training, and also trying to introduce them to this mm -hmm. history mm -hmm. to really kind of demonstrate how they can also incorporate it and use it. Um, but I mean, I would just echo everything that Diana said. It, it's going to be a, a prolonged kind of battle, but it's definitely one that we have to do. Yeah, and I agree with that too. As a black bookstore owner, just to touch on what Dinah said, a lot of people think, oh, it's just black history. And we get comments all the time by people that say, oh, these, these books are just for, for black people. No, this, these mm -hmm. books are for every single person to have mm -hmm. this knowledge, this mm -hmm. history. You know, it creates empathy and knowledge mm -hmm. and a whole different base that we're not working with, to be honest, right now. Mm -hmm. But people want to relegate it to just this, this community or this audience when it should be for everybody. You know, Absolutely. I think we had to read so much of everybody else's history. So it should be, and we had to develop, right? <laughs> had yeah. to develop this sense of empathy toward, you know, mm -hmm. oppressors. So mm -hmm. it's not just, oh, Black History Month or just for, you know, mm -hmm. these little extracurricular aspects. It's for everyone. So you, you hit a nerve for me there, mm -hmm. but I, I agree. Mm -hmm. um, another question here is, it says, I recently received a research grant for this summer. How do we navigate the archives and gatekeepers in the midst Ooh. of a pandemic with this, this type of information we're looking for? Kelly, you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So I have a couple of, of thoughts about it. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> First is that I do think that there are archivists. Archivists in general are unique people, mm -hmm. right? So you get to learn the kind of how to 
you got to find a rhythm with them in general. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I think there's legit gatekeeping happening, and other times I think it's just like you haven't found the language that's working with the archivist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I sort of highly recommend um, reaching out to the archivist mm-hmm. early, respectfully, mm-hmm. introducing yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It's great if you have like one of these residency research things. I don't know. I think the question said they got a research grant or something Mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. One of the things I would recommend is very early on, even if it's just like a little outdoor brown bag lunch session, if you just talk a little bit about your project and what you're interested in and what you're looking for, just before the archivist, it's like a little presentation. It could be 15, 20 minutes. I did that when I was in residence, and for weeks after, different archivists would be coming up to me mm-hmm. with records that I hadn't thought about or that they knew, you know, because they know these collections, right? Mm-hmm. They know where some of these things are. So that's one of the approaches that I would just sort of say. The other thing is you have to also take, you know, Dr. Berry's sort of example to heart, too, and just keep doggedly pressing forward, mm-hmm. you know, request to see the documents, look through it yourself, um, double and triple check. Um, but it is, it's, it's going to be intense. And with the pandemic now, you know, I think some of them are opening up. They are. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can get in some. It will be interesting to see as summer progresses how how much more open they'll go. But I don't know that. Dr. Berry, yeah, Dr. Berry. yeah. I'll just add um, that you know, there's some of the some of the blame that archivists get is is um, is unfair because if you if you look at when an archive was created, um, the problem is for, for at least for Black history, we just weren't part of the inventories like when they were describing when when they were drafting these these documents they weren't saying that oh yeah here's they were looking at the the donors and the donor families and maybe in there was buried a story of a black person you know the housekeeper or the enslaved person you know what have you they're buried in there and so you, i would say you have to look at the original records don't i mean they might send you the digitized but that you want to see what's in the margins because sometimes black history is just in the margins and sometimes we find our stories in the margins of these records. And when you look at digitization, because it may be not a part of the, phys- the original record, um, that they won't scan that part. So even if you have um, a document and they say, oh, well, we have it on microfilm or we have a, here's a, here's a copy. I say, I'd like to see the original, please. Unless it's out of circulation, they can't let you see it, push to see the original. That's something that, that both of our advisors trained us to do, always ask for the original. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then writing ahead of time, giving them as much uh, details you're comfortable with before you come so that they can have stuff ready for you if you can physically go there. If not, ask if they can loan or send or send you the digital copy until you can get there. But communication is key. And most archivists, sometimes they're learning with you. The best archivists are those that like go on the journey with you. Like, cause, like Dr. Grosso keeps, like they'll be thinking about it after they've met with you and they'll keep bringing you stuff. And like, I have some really great relationships with archivists all over the country, both of us do, from just working in the archives and being there and letting them know that we're serious researchers. So letting them know, let them know I'm on fellowship. I'm here for this. You know, I, I'm not big to drop names or anything like that, but let them know that you're a serious researcher when you come and, and, and that you're there and you want some support. Have you gone back to, to, to any of those archivists and held up your book and said, look what I did with all this time oh, that I've been here? I, mean, I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> I, I am ready to get on an airplane when it's safe and go do that. <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine yeah. what they may feel just in being in communication with you throughout that journey like that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, another question that I personally have. So you guys, I'm going to put on my Cali hat, you know, just referencing what you said earlier. She kind of goes to the dark side. <laughs> sounds like. But we talked about the women who, you know, were triumphant to you. What was there any story here that really infuriated you? Was you uncovered the research? Was that was there any of those feelings as you gone, went on this journey? Or was it all just like, oh, OK, this is good? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. No. <laughs> my, mine were black female enslavers or slaveholders, I think. And I, I, you know, remember really struggling about writing about that because I think people misunderstand and they over exaggerate and they blame black people for slavery because we, because if any of us owned any of us, then, then we're responsible and slavery is null and void. You know? So I was like, we I remember we talked about this. We were like, we've got to find a way to have this discussion. And somebody didn't like the fact that we said, 
you know, um, maybe it was an editor or something, not our editor, but we said something like, this is a hard conversation to have. And they were like, take that out. Like it's too commentary. I was like, no, but then the reader, we wanted the reader to know that this was a hard part for us to write. Um, I think that's it. And just, but then trying to, trying to, to teach the readers that there's a, a variety of ways in which black people own black people or enslave black people. Some of it was about reclaiming family so that they could get, get out of slavery. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm still trying to figure out the numbers. That's just, we don't have the stats on how many, but people use that one fact and say, hey, you know, uh, why are black people mad about slavery? They enslave themselves. And that's just something we wanted to try to address. So mm -hmm. that was hard, um, particularly the ones that did own um, large amounts of enslaved people and treated them as chattel slaves. That was hard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure. I think mine is the, the story of the Black Wax, the Women's Army Corps. Um, Once they open up and, you know, women are allowed to serve, you have recruiters and Black women who were interested in nursing actually going to enlist. One, right to support the country. They imagine that they're going to serve. And also because they're told that they'll obtain training, mm -hmm. right, medical training and, and things they're interested in nursing that they could use even after they serve. Mm -hmm. So once they enlist, of course, the white women blacks are the ones who receive the medical training. Mm -hmm. And the black um, women's article officers are basically left to like mop up the floors, mm -hmm. change bedpans, do this sort of thing. So they are infuriated and actually um, go on strike. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, they get threatened with a court martial. A bunch of them go back, but they're a core of, of the black women who say that they'll they'll suffer it and they'll face mm -hmm. a court martial. They actually are court martialed. And then the black community is enraged because mm -hmm. these are, you know, young women who do this admirable thing. They, you know, they're joining the serve. They told that they're going to receive this training. Then they're relegated to this other work. So Thurgood Marshall actually had signed on to represent them on an appeal. Mm -hmm. So the army at that point is having like, you know, they're trying to just get out of this thing. It's a PR nightmare, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just want a way out. So they find like a technicality to basically void the court martial, right? So, but the women just go back to the exact same conditions mm -hmm. that they have been fighting and protesting. And mm -hmm. my heart broke for them mm -hmm. because, yeah. you know, they yeah. joined in this thing, with, you know, signed on with this optimism and this earnestness to serve and to learn. Mm -hmm. And they just were totally exploited even after they fought an uphill battle and faced mm -hmm. the court martial and everything. You know, they still ended up being returned to those positions where they were basically like the cleanup crew on the mm -hmm. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. So we have time for just two more questions here really quickly. One um, from Sabrina, she asked, did you split the chapters between the both of you? Or did you both work on each chapter from research to writing? What was your process really quick? We worked on we both we worked on it together. Um, we, but the thing that was nice about the book is that we have two different areas of strength. Like my work is obviously early nineteenth century, um, and hers is late nineteenth century forward. So that really helped. But we both have been teaching Black women's history throughout the whole time period. We teach U.S. history throughout both time periods. So our expertise um, in Black women is more specific to specific time periods. But we worked together. Um, it was collaborative. We would share stuff back and forth. There were parts where, you know, one person would write a paragraph, the other person would, you know, tighten it up and then vice versa. So it was very, very collaborative experience for us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What are two or three of your favorite history books? You know, you guys deep into history. This question is from Derek. Uh, two to three of your favorite history books or historians that inspired you? Golly. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, I can say one. One, I, well, I'll say one, then you can, that'll give you the time to think of two others. <laughs> I, I think what inspired me, Deborah Gray White's Aren't I a Woman as a graduate <laughs> student. <laughs> That's what I wanted to go first. <laughs> No, I think every Black woman in grad school that went through, you know, when we did, that book was earth uh, life changing because we saw ourselves 200 years ago. So mm. that's that's what I would say about, I would say Deborah Gray White's. Mm -hmm. Definitely Deborah Gray White's, also Paula Giddings, yes. When and Where I Enter. Yeah, yep. yeah. 
Classic. And also, good. it's a primary source, but Anna Julia Cooper's original work, A Voice from the South, yes, from 1893, mm -hmm. um, she really sort of lays out this. I was thinking about this like an early intersectional kind of feminist view about mm -hmm. the role and the position of Black women in America. Mm -hmm. So those those two are my my favorite. I also really like this will be the last one, and I'll shush. You got me talking books now. Hey, I know. Don't get us started. I love it. <laughs> the other <laughs> is um is Tara Hunter's to yes. Tara mm -hmm. um, yeah. Also, I think a really really great history, but learned a lot from the book and a lot mm -hmm. from how the book was written. Mm. Yeah, that's good. That's a great book. Um, I would I would go back to a primary book, primary source, The Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl by Harry Jacobs. I think mm -hmm. that should be required reading along with Frederick Douglass's, um, uh, autobi one of his three uh, autobiographies or narratives. Um, and then I would say Ida B. Wells' Red Record, even though that's mm -hmm. not, yeah, those are, those are like foundational for us, um, very foundational books for us. Um, and, and When and Where I Enter was another one. So yeah. those are those are the ones I would say. Powerful. So in closing, thank you for sharing that. There are some I need to write. I'm going to watch the replay and go back and get some of these books that I need to add to my own personal collection. But what do you, um, and someone's like, please list the books. We will. <laughs> well, watch the replay, Miss Butler, Pam Butler. Mm -hmm. So, Oh, Dinah's putting them in. She's so good. Professor. <laughs> um, but I was going to say, just in closing, what do you want young women to walk away with once they read this book? When they get this book in their hands, whether they're teens or not, but or young, you know, what do you want them to walk away with when they read this powerful book? Hmm. I'm typing, so I'm gonna let you go first. <laughs> you know, I, it's a, it's a great question. So I wrote this book with my own daughter in mind. Mm -hmm. um, and how old is she, Callie? How old is she's she? She's eleven. Okay. She's eleven, and so I really do want. I, I really thought a lot about what I wanted her to learn. And basically what I want them to see is the beauty, the beautiful expanse of black womanhood, mm -hmm. right? In every iteration. And I mean that literally from like phenotypically, right? Mm -hmm. The beautiful blackest berry, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> to all the other gradations on mm -hmm. down. I wanted to embrace that. Um, I wanted her to see beautiful images of dark complexion, black women. I mm -hmm. wanted her to see images of women who were educated, who were athletes, who are artists, women who had been incarcerated. I wanted queer, I just wanted it all. Mm -hmm. Women who were holiness preachers, right? Women mm -hmm. who were who were sex workers. Like I just mm -hmm. wanted her to see the expanse of black womanhood because mm -hmm. it was important for us to include the the triumph as well as the people who didn't because that represents the totality of our experience even mm -hmm. if someone wasn't able to overcome an obstacle we still learn from that mm -hmm. so i guess that's like the thing that i wanted her to just be able to read this book and see the full expanse of all that we are and what we can accomplish when we organize and what we've come through mm. that's good that's good that's good, good. That's good. Mine's easy. I, I think um, I wrote I wrote it thinking about the book that I wish I had read as a, a little girl because I grew up in a predominantly white community in Northern mm -hmm. California, but my family was from the East Coast and, you know, I had black culture and I'm very confident of who I was as a black person, as a young black girl, but I never saw myself at school. I never saw myself at the career day. I never saw myself in the books that we read. So um, yeah, I, I have a son, um, but we, you know, it, at his school, I've always talked at his school um, and I've always made sure that his classrooms had books that, with people that looked like me and, and just multiracial, multi experience I would buy books for his school classroom so that there wasn't just, you know, um, so, they, they would, they, so that all the kids in his classroom would, ha would see people that look like them. Mm -hmm. um, people that had two moms, people that had two dads, you know, I would try to find reading at that grade level for them. Um, and so I think, that would that was for me. I was thinking like, what would I have done to have had a book like this? Um, and that's that was where I, that motivated me. And so now, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of girls and boys will have access, especially for the young reader version. I think will be just so powerful. And I do hope that a lot of schools pick up that edition and put it into these kids' hands and make it required. That's the kicker. 
as somebody asked the question earlier, how do we make this text required? But even if the schools don't require it as parents, how do we get it into the kids' hands and, and know how powerful it is? So I'm excited that you guys are doing this. I can't wait to, to get that into the hands of all of our readers that come into Mahogany Books. Um, I'm just honored to have both of you here in conversation tonight. So thank you both. Any last words that you have? I just, I'm honored. So. Just wanna say thank you for, for having us. Uh, thank you for celebrating our work and Black women's history. And um, you know we, we're gonna support, we've always supported Black bookstores. I'm happy to know that you have a second location. Congratulations. Yes. And the next time, my, my husband's from DC, so the next time we come to DC, we will definitely come and see you all. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you both for that. Thanks so much for this opportunity. Thank you for supporting Black Women's History and thank you for making Black Books Matter. Hey, absolutely. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. Thank you so much. Have a great evening and a great week. Take care.